Well, good morning, church. Glad you're here. Is anybody excited about church this morning? Come on, somebody. Look, I'll just tell you guys, as I, um, as I did our team this morning, it, it's been a tough week for me. Uh, my little boy, Arrow, had fever for four days in a row. Um, my little girl right now has the flu, and that's where Miranda is. And so it's just been one of those weeks. Anybody else have any sick family, friends? I believe half our town is sick right now. Um, in fact, let, let's do this. Let's, let's just pray for them real quick, and then we'll, we'll get on with the message. Let's pray for them. Lord, right now we just lift up every single person, loved one, friend, um, those that we may not even know, Lord, that are sick right now with the flu and, and sinus stuff. Lord, we just lift them up to you right now in those families. Uh, God, that can be a stressful thing to deal with, especially with kids. And so, Lord, we, we know and believe that you are a healer. And, God, we just pray right now that you would begin to heal those that are sick, Lord, and, and bring them uh, to health quickly, Lord. So we just lift that up to you, and we pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So anyways, it's, it's been a rough week for me. And so I, I got to church this morning. I found myself just being really excited about being here. And I felt like in that moment, the Holy Spirit just reminded me that I don't have to do church today. I get to do church today. And, and in that moment, I just realized that, you know, we as human beings, we desire to make a difference in this world. We desire to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And that's exactly what we get to do this morning. So come on, somebody, Are you excited to do church this morning? I'm so glad you're here. Well, check it out. If it's your first time, I do want to say again, thank you so much for coming to High Ridge Church. And as Sydney said earlier, we would love for you to fill out that card. Now, listen, we are a hassle-free church, all right? So we're not going to show up to your door. We're not going to bother you uh, unless you want communication. But my wife and I would love to send you a thank you card for coming and hanging out with us. So again, if this is your first time, please fill that card out. And you can just drop it in that wooden box by the door as you exit. Just drop it in the top, all right? So again, we're glad you're here. Church, can we just give it up for all of our first-time guests and show them some love? We're just glad you're here. All right, so this is week two of this focus this month, Better Together. Um, and last week, we kind of kicked off this month with this idea that God has really created us as human beings, not to do life alone, but together. And not to just do life together, but actually grow in relationship with Jesus together. And so this whole focus this month is really on this idea that we are better together. Because see, the enemy, one of the number one ways that he attacks our life is to isolate us from a church family or isolate us from our brothers and sisters. And so we want to combat that with, with running with this idea that we are truly better together and God has designed us this way. And so last week, we spent our entire time in the message in Acts chapter 2. And if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go and watch that message. You can go to highridgegram.com and watch it. But listen, I'm, I'm just telling you to go watch it because I believe God did some amazing things last week. And we learned some incredible things from his word. But I just want to recap that message for you last week because it's critical for us to have that foundation as we build on it this week. So last week, what we looked at in Acts chapter 2 was following the event of Pentecost. Now, for those of you who may not know or you're new to the Bible or new to Christianity, uh, Pentecost was an event really that happened in the New Testament where Peter, the, uh, uh, the disciple Peter, gives a message. It was repent and be baptized, basically the gospel. He shared with all these people, and there were thousands and thousands of people there that day, and he basically shared the good news of Jesus. And the Bible says on that day, 3,000 were added to their number. 3,000 people were saved. How amazing would that be? And so what we saw is that there was this huge moment there where the gospel was shared and, and, and this fire began to spread throughout the Middle East. And what we saw in Acts chapter 2 and what we really focused in on last week was that from the moment that Peter gave that message, it started something. And what began to happen is these believers and in their new relationship with Jesus were so fired up about following after him and growing in their relationship with him that they began meeting in homes. And so what you see is not only did people show up to sit in rows, they actually went to grow in a relationship with Christ in circles and in homes. And in Acts chapter 2, we saw that they were coming together, they were breaking bread, they were fellowshipping together, and they were praying for one another. And what I wanted us to focus on last week, and here's what I believe we see in Acts chapter 2, is that after the gospel is shared, the people of God begin to build relationship with one another, and they begin to move forward in unity. Now, despite their differences, their walks of life, their skin color, and all these other things that they didn't have in common, there's one thing they did have in common. They had in common that they love Jesus and they love people. And this is the unity that they were moving forward in. So last week I wanted to show you, listen, if we can agree together, 
If we can agree together to love Jesus, that he is the one and true way to salvation, if we can agree to love him and love people, then all this other stuff we can agree to disagree on. Then all this other stuff that the enemy tries to use to divide us as a church, to divide us as family, well, they use music and they don't baptize by submersion and they don't do this and they read from this translation. See, the enemy uses all that nonsense to divide the family of God because if he divides us, he can isolate us and if he isolates us, he can keep us from God's will. And so what I believe we were seeing in the early church in Acts chapter two was a group of people who said, you know what? We love Jesus and we're gonna build relationships and we're gonna move forward in unity. And then what we saw was that God began to add to their number and save people daily. Can you imagine seeing something like this? I was thinking about this as I was studying this scripture. Like I I was like, man, God, what was it like to be there? I mean, what was it like to be there on the day of Pentecost and see 3,000 people pray to receive Christ? I don't think we have an area in Graham big enough for an altar call that big. Like, that is a lot of people. And I was thinking, man, God, how awesome would it be, man, to see people, like, actually reaching out to their neighbors and those in their workplace and, like, just inviting them into their home and loving them despite their differences and, and just moving together in unity and seeing people saved, not just in church on Sundays, but in people's homes. Man, God, how awesome would that be? And as I was sitting here thinking about, man, what would it be like to be there, I felt the Holy Spirit convict me in that moment. And he said, you know what, son, you don't have to imagine, you just have to believe. And in that moment, I began to think, okay, God, what are you trying to show me? And here's what I believe, that that God's not done. He's not the God of salvation in the past. He's the God in the present and of the future as well. And God wants to do the same things that he did in the past and in the scriptures. And he wants to do those same things today. And I believe we can see these things happen in our life. And so what I wanted you to see last week is that relationships plus unity equals a move of God. I believe God is waiting for a group of people that's willing to just put him back on the throne of their life. You know what's interesting about the the early church and what's happening in Acts chapter two? Watch this, this is so important. They still had lives outside of church. Like I think sometimes we go, well, that was the early church. All they did was just pray all day. They didn't have bills to pay. They didn't have a life outside of church. And so, yeah, it was easy to be super Christians, all right? But Zach, I got bills to pay. I got sick kids. But you know, as I was thinking, I've never thought of this before, they still had lives. They still had jobs. They still had relationships. They still had other things in their life going on. But what happened in the early church is they put Jesus back on the throne of their life and him being the number one focus of their life. And when they did that, God began to move through that. So listen to me, friends. I believe that we can see and are starting to see a revival in Graham. I believe that the God we just got through worshiping is the same God that we saw move in Acts. I believe that God wants to change lives. I believe he wants to see your loved ones and your coworkers and even some of you in here. I believe he wants to see people saved and restored. He wants to make a difference in this town and through our lives. I believe he wants to do something. And all he's asking us to do is just trust him, to follow after him, be desperately in love with Jesus not with a method of church, but with Jesus, because he can do something with that. And so that's what we saw last week. And here's what I wanna do today. I want us to continue on this idea that, man, God wants to empower us to love people. God wants to empower us and strengthen us to go and reach people, to love them, and, and not just to rely on the pastor to see people saved, but actually use you to lead people to Christ, actually use us to go out and be the hands and the feet of Jesus in this town. I believe that God wants to strengthen our love for others. And if we can grab hold of this idea that we are truly better together, that's exactly what we're going to see. So, so here's my hope simply for us this morning. My hope is that we would have the courage, that we would be courageous, if you will, in our love for others. That we would be courageous in our love for others. Now, the reason that I've chosen this word is because the Latin root of this word is cur, C-O-R. And here's what it means. When it originally came in to the English language, and let me read it for you so I don't butcher it. Here's what it meant. It meant to, to love someone, to tell to love them so much that you tell your story with your whole heart. So courage actually means being willing to be who God has created you to be. That's what courage is. 
Courage is going, you know what? I'm gonna say I'll love you first. Courage is, you know what? I'm gonna invest in this relationship even if it doesn't work out. Courage is loving someone, inviting someone into your home despite what they bring to the relationship. Courage is loving people on the level that Christ has called us to love people and that is a sacrificial love. And rather than engaging in a relationship going, okay, what am I gonna get out of this? Does this person make me feel good? Does this person always encourage me? Rather than approaching a relationship that way, what courage is is saying, you know what? I'm just gonna love them no matter what. I'm gonna love them because Christ first loved me. So my hope today is that we would have a courageous love for those that God has placed in our life. Amen? Amen. So here's what I wanna do before we get into God's word this morning. I wanna pray for us and, and, and just ask God to prepare our hearts for what we're gonna see because I, I, I truly believe this, friends. If you'll grab hold of what God's gonna say this morning and share through his word, I believe that it's gonna transform your life and not just yours, those around you. And that's what we're looking for, amen? So let's pray. Lord, right now, just pray that you prepare our hearts. God, as we dig into your word, God, as we study your word, God, I pray that you would use it just to speak to our hearts. And God, for all of us in this room, despite how busy life is, despite all the things that we've got going on and all the stress, God, I pray that after this morning, that we would become a church, that we would become a group of people and sons and daughters of yours, focused back on putting your son on the throne of our life. That we would be a group of people that's following after you, God, that you would be the number one focus of our life. So God, I just pray that's what stirred in us this morning as we read your word. So Lord, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, the first scripture I'm gonna look at this morning is in John chapter 16 and verse 13. And, and before I read this, the, the reason I'm looking at this verse this morning is because before we get into this idea and, and further pursue this idea of better together, there's something that we need to realize about life that Jesus remind even his disciples of. And so here's what the scripture says. This is Jesus speaking here. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Sounds good so far. And in the world you'll have tribulation. We just took a 180 here. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Man, this is an interesting verse. I, I like to call this verse like a love sandwich or a positive, negative, positive. You know what I'm talking about? It's like that girl that comes up to you and says, oh, girl, your hair is so pretty. But listen, I don't like your lipstick. But your shoes are nice, right? And, and it's one of those love sandwiches where you didn't hear anything else, but she didn't like your lipstick, right? That might be a terrible example, but you get what I'm saying. I feel like this is one of those moments with Jesus, right? Like this is a love sandwich from him. He's like, hey guys, um, I've said these things to you that, that, that in me, you'll have peace. Yay, awesome, Jesus, great, we love that. Um, but also in this world, you'll have tribulation. Time out. Like Jesus the Messiah, and the disciples he's speaking to believe that he's the Messiah. He's come to make all the wrongs right. Like he's the ultimate king. He's coming in on the white style and all these things that they believed about Jesus. And now that Jesus who's come for their vengeance and make things right is now telling them they're gonna have tribulation. Like you, you gotta be thinking like the disciples are like, okay, Jesus, like I didn't sign off for this. What, what are you talking about? But see, what I find interesting and what we still need to grab hold of today is that things still go wrong in the world that we live in. And listen, because we love Jesus doesn't mean that we're, that we're void of those things. It doesn't mean that the bad things aren't going to happen to us. Because we know from Scripture that just because you love Jesus doesn't mean things aren't going to go wrong in your life. We see in scripture that, that people still lose their lives and they still get sick and things just happen. They lose their job. Life still happens because we live in a broken world. And so there's a reason that Jesus reminds us that, listen, though you love me and yes, I'm, I'm a God of miracles and yes, I can step in at any time and I can, I can make wrong things right. I can do all those things. Remember, disciples, that you still live in a broken world and trials and tribulation are still going to happen. So Jesus reminds, listen, yeah, you have peace because you're in me, but remember, peace is not the absence of chaos, it's the response to chaos. And so Jesus sets his disciples up to remember, listen, things are going to go wrong sometimes. Things happen. And here's the reason, I, listen, I'm not trying to be negative here. I, I'm not trying to bring bad news. I'm just trying to give you reality because I believe what follows is what Jesus really wants to scrap hold of. 
The reality is, is things just happen in this world. You're gonna have loved ones that battle cancer. You're gonna have loved ones that go through surgery. You're gonna experience sickness at times in your life. You may even lose a job. The stress and weight of this world at times is going to come against your life. We know that to be true from scripture. You signed up to follow after Jesus, not for cupcakes, rainbows, and unicorns. And sometimes following after him, what did Jesus say to disciples? He said, hey, if any of you would come after me, take up your cross daily and follow after me. You know what that cross represents? Sacrifice. And so the reality is, is Jesus understands and, and, and wants his disciples to know, wants us to know that following after him, man, it's, it's amazing and there's joy in it. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes things happen. Life happens. And so if this is a reality, friends, then what is one of the keys to overcoming that? How do we overcome when life happens? And this is gonna be our focus today. Because I believe that in order for us to overcome these situations and these scenarios in our life, we can't do it by ourselves. And here's the first thing I want you to see this weekend if you're taking notes. We've gotta have each other's back. See, one of the keys to overcoming life and and making it through these situations is you cannot do this on your own. Yes, you have Jesus, but Jesus also designed us to be together in relationship and grow together with one another and spur one another on. And so the first thing I want you to see is we are to have each other's back. Look to the person to your right. Say, I got your back. Come on, let's do it. Look to the person to your left. Say, I got your back. Hey, look at me, church. I got your back. It's important for you to understand that we're to have each other's back despite our differences. Here's what 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build, not, not put down, not tear down, not gossip about, but build one another up just as you are doing. Now, the Christians here in the city of Thessalonica, what would happen was Paul and his crew had come in and, and shared the gospel, and, and there was a move of Christianity that began in Thessalonica. But what happened was is the authorities and some Jews rose up against Paul and his crew, and they ran them out of the city. And so in this moment, what had happened was, and the reason that Paul is writing this letter to Thessalonica is because they had a lot of baby Christians, young in their faith, Christians in this, in this city. And because they were young in their faith, what was happening was they were dealing with several issues in the church there. So Paul writes them to encourage them and build them up. And one of the things, not just the only thing, but one of the things he encourages them in is doing life together, encouraging one another, and having each other's back, building one another up. You know, one of the things here at Harvest Church that we're always going to do is encourage people. It's a part of our culture. And I tell our team all the time, our greeters and our ushers and our kids team, listen, for some people that show up here on a weekend, this is the only place in their life where they get encouraged. It's the only place in their life where actually life is being spoken over them. We're always going to be an encouraging church because we want to remember, again, despite our circumstances, we can find joy in following after Jesus, amen? So we're gonna encourage one another and build one another up. And at the end of the day, friends, one of the keys to to making it through these situations in life, when life comes against us, it's having each other's back. Now, back in biblical times, the Roman Empire was the superpower of the world. Now, there are several reasons why Rome was the superpower, one of the greatest civilizations that we see in history. I mean, they, they built roads that gave them access to trade that other countries didn't have. There were several things. It was the Bronze Age. There were a lot of things that made them a superpower. But one of those things was their military as well. And one of the reasons that their military was so strong was because of this concept right here, that every single military warrior, every single warrior understood that maybe he doesn't like this guy beside him, but at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, they're gonna have each other's back. In fact, the the Roman Empire, their their military had these strategies that that wrapped around this idea that this is a formation we're gonna create because at the end of the day, we're only as strong as our weakest link and we've got to have each other's back. Now, I find that interesting and the reason I share that with you is because you have to understand when Paul is writing these things, he's writing them in context to the culture that his people understand. Now watch this, this is important for you. Later on, Paul writes a letter to the church of Ephesus. And in chapter six, in regards to spiritual warfare, Paul encourages Christians to put on the whole armor of God. Now for any of you that spent any time in church, you've heard this passage multiple times. 
But Paul basically goes through and says, hey, you're going to face spiritual warfare in your life. Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the darkness and principalities of this world. And in order for you to win these spiritual battles in your life, Paul goes on to say, you need to put on the whole armor of God. And he uses what the Romans would wear at that time, their armor as an example. So he goes through the, the, he's got the helmet and the shield and the sword and the belt of truth and the breastplate and the shoes. He goes through the whole thing. But here's the interesting thing about that passage in chapter six. Watch this. There's no armor on the back. So when Paul writes this in a, to the church of Ephesus in chapter six, there's this understanding that, yeah, you're putting on all this armor to go to battle, but you're not going to battle alone. You're going to battle with your brothers and sisters and you don't need armor on your back because you're to have each other's back. So listen, friends, as we face life, as we pursue Jesus, as we face the situations in life and we've got loved ones, we've got to understand and just operate in this idea that we're to have each other's back. It doesn't matter if you're not BFF with a person or not. You know they're going through a situation. You know their husband's having surgery. Be there for them. Listen, you, you may not like her. Maybe she did something in the past to hurt you, but you know her family's having financial difficulty. You need to step in and have her back. We are to love one another. We're to encourage one another, and we're to build each other up. And friends, in order for us to do this, we've got to do church like we see in Acts 2. We've got to build relationships. We've got to move forward in unity and we've got to have each other's back. So before we move on with the rest of this message, I, I want to share a testimony video of a lady named Dawn Milson. She's from Fort Worth. She goes to High Ridge. And Dawn had experienced some horrible things in her life. And, and as she got plugged into church and as she got plugged into a group of people, God began to move through that and bring healing to her life. And so I want you guys to check out this video because I think it encouraged you this morning. Watch this. Growing up, I accepted the Lord as my Savior probably when I was nine years old. But I never really felt that anyone loved me. My dad was very strict. So from the time I was nine... My spiritual life growing up just depended on God, not people. I was uh, married to a man that uh, hurt me all the time. So I was came from domestic violence, 13 years of abuse, of being cut, beaten, and stabbed multiple times, taking my children into hiding to save our lives and the lives of my family. I couldn't tell people what was going on because it would put my family's life in danger. I learned to not trust people. The people I loved always hurt me in my life. And then my sister got cancer in April. In five months, she was dead by September. When my sister was taken from me, I was like, how do I keep this family together? Now, I'm alone now. I felt so alone. Every person I had trusted in my life literally had hurt me, and I could not trust. I was tired. I was like, God, I'm trying, but I'm getting close to giving up here because I was trying to do it alone. And one day my son said, uh, he said, Mom, I'm finding us a church. And this was the most amazing, the most amazing thing. Josh and his wife take off driving, and High Ridge has a big sign at the bottom that says you're invited. And he looked at his wife, Amy, and he said, well, Amy, they invited us. That's where we're going. And he came home and he said, Mom, this is the church. He said, this is what you've been looking for. I'm telling you, Mom. I had visited High Ridge Church, and I walked in. When I walked in High Ridge Church, I thought I had finally come home. That's the way I felt. We knew no one. And because of not trusting people, I was not a group person. I'm always happy to help someone else. But to let someone in was a huge step for me. And so, but God told me, you're going to sign up for a group. I believe it was starting the next week. I waited till really close to the end to find a group to sign up for, and there wasn't that many openings. So I'm like, God, and I prayed. I was like, wherever you want me, wherever you want me, God, you pick the group. I showed up on Wednesday, and I'm like, okay, God, I'm scared. I don't know anyone, but I'm walking in this house. And I walked in, and I saw the people, and I'm, I could not have handpicked a better group for myself. And I go through this life study, and they're talking about trusting people and what is said here stays here. 
I grew and started trusting these people and started allowing them to know what was happening in my life. I uh, felt God telling me to start having the group pray for my husband. I was very fortunate enough to meet my, I've been married 17 years now, to meet a wonderful man. So the next semester was coming and my husband said, Dawn, I want to join the group. He said, I would love to go through the group, which totally shocked me. And my husband actually totally gave himself to God and was baptized. Do you see how God's working? It's changed my family, my husband's family, my son's family. The first time my husband got to come and his mother got to come, I said, we've been married 17 years together, 18. And I said, honey, I said, was it nice to be in church with your mom? I know it's been a while, you know, because since I'd known him, they'd not been in church together. And he said, Don, this is the first time I've ever been to church with my mom. Did, has Highridge changed our family? Yes, Highridge has changed our family. And that's what I love about Highridge. They take what you are, who you are, what God has built in you, and they grow it. They were like, God wants you to serve. And I was like, I love people. I can smile. I can greet people. You know, I was like... And I would say that I have been a believer most of my life, but I didn't know the next step. I knew, you know, and that's where High Ridge takes you from one step to the next, and they just move you forward and help you get there. And so through the group, through my serving, through greeting, they just kept growing me as a person. And that's what I feel at High Ridge, and I just want to thank them for loving me and my family and giving us such an awesome place to worship. High Ridge has given me my joy back. Man, isn't that awesome? Can we just give it up for Jesus as well? See, that that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I mean, you, you had a lady who went and, and put herself out there. I mean, she'd been through hell, and she goes to a group, and she begins to build relationships, move forward in unity, and God began to move in her life. And she began to see her family members saved and, and come back to the Lord. I mean, what an incredible testimony to exactly what I've been trying to show us out of Acts chapter two. So listen to me, friends. The idea here is that in order for us to, to be who God's called us to be, not just some of what he's called us to be, I'm talking about all that he's called us to be. A part of that is being in a group of people that love Jesus and love you. So here's the second thing I want you to see this morning if you're taking notes. Here's the second thing. God uses people to strengthen our faith. Not just a worship set, not just a pastor, and not just a church. He uses people to strengthen our faith. Listen, God is in the people business. Now, he doesn't need us. He wants us. And he uses people. We see this throughout scripture. He uses men and women to do great things in the world. God wants to use people. Here's what Proverbs 27, 17 says. It says, iron sharpens iron. And one man sharpens another. I love this verse. As iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. So I did a study um, a few months ago. And, and really what I did is I went to Google. Okay, so I went to Google and I wanted to find out what are the oldest tools in the world. And one of the oldest tools in the world is a knife. Now there's some research that says that um, there were knives found in Kenya, Africa, as old as two million years. Now, I'm not here to argue the age of the earth or mankind. The, the point is, the knife is old. And what I find interesting is that out of all the technology that we've been able to create, and of all the things that we've created as man, I mean, come on, we've created and invented sliced bread. you think we would find a better way to cut things, but we haven't. Nonetheless, today in 2018, still the best way to cut something is with a knife. Now, what makes a knife better than another knife, how sharp it is, right? In fact, men, pride, they find pride in this, like they have the sharpest knife, they get weird about it. And then they apologize if it's dull. But, but a knife and how sharp it is, is important, right? Why? Because a knife was created to cut things. And if it's dull, it can't create, uh, cut things, right? So for those of you who may not know, all knives have serrated edges. Now, if you look at a knife, you, you've probably seen on, on the larger ones, you can see the actual teeth, if you will, on the knife. But even a small knife, like a pocket knife, if you look under, under a microscope, it has a serrated edge. And what begins to happen to a knife with a serrated, serrated edge is that as it cuts things, teeth begin to bend. And that's what dulls the knife. 
And so a knife is extremely dull it's because the serrated edge, the teeth on that knife have been bent. So in order to sharpen the knife, the goal is to realign those teeth. So you take metal of whatever kind and begin to rub it against the knife's edge. And what it begins to do is realign the teeth's edge of that knife to make it sharp again. Now watch this, friends. As iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. When you go through this life and you face sickness and you lose a loved one and you experience financial difficulty and things in this world are just going chaotic, what begins to happen as you go through life is you begin to lose your edge. And see, the way that God has created us is to be in relationship with not only him, but with others. Because when we show up to group, when we grow in relationship and we build one another up and we encourage one another as we see the day coming, as we speak life over each other and as we have each other's back, God realigns our spirit. And so now, once we've been realigned, we can continue through life as the sons and daughters he's called us to be. Friends, God uses people to strengthen your faith. And you can't do this on your own. And, and for some of you, man, it's, you, you've gone through some stuff and you just need some encouragement. You, you don't need someone to give you all the solutions. You just need somewhere, someone to just be there for you. And this is how God uses people. And here's the last thing I have for you this morning as we close up. Not only does God use people to strengthen your faith, God expects us to strengthen other people's faith. See, friends, for many of you, 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 some of you, you've sat around, man, I'm just waiting for someone to show up. Why isn't anyone here for me? Why isn't anyone helping me out? And you get into this woe is me mentality. And the reality is you're not doing that for anyone either. See, in Romans 15, here's what Paul says. He says, we who are strong have an obligation. So he's talking about believers. He's talking to Christians here. Those of you that love Jesus, that are pursuing after him, we have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And not to please ourselves, but let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. God uses people to strengthen our faith, but he expects us to do that for others as well. So here's my question for you this morning. Because some of you are sitting here like, man, Zach, this is all great. This is two weeks of hearing about groups and better together. Listen, bro, I've got my friends. I've got my crew. I go to group. We do a Bible study. Okay. So uh, when are we going to move on to the next thing? Well, here's the question I have for you. When's the last time you invited your neighbor to your group? When's the last time you reached out to a coworker? Because the reality is this, friends, I, I want you to grab hold of this. God has called all of us to be the witnesses to the world. He's called all of us to tell our testimony, our story. We're to testify to what Jesus has done in our life to our neighbors and our coworkers. It's not just on me, it's us together. So the question for you is, okay, I'm glad you're mature in your faith. I'm glad you're leading a Bible study. Man, awesome, I'm so happy for you. But, but when's the last time you told someone about Jesus? But when's the last time you invited that guy across the street? that throws parties all the time. You know, he's probably an alcoholic. When's the last time you went over and said, hey man, I'm having some people over tonight and having some food. Why don't you come and join us? But when's the last time you reached out to that girl at work who has five kids, who's been divorced three times and no one in this town wants to touch. When's the last time you went to her and said, hey, I'm having some people over. Why don't you just come on over? Don't bring anything. Just come, come hang out. Listen to me, friends, in order for us to be the people, let's forget the church, the people that God has called us to be. We've got to view this world through the lens that Jesus did. And Jesus had a lens of compassion. Do you know what compassion is? It means to see other people suffering and be so concerned about it that it moves you to action. Because if you just look at people and feel sorry for them and do nothing about it, then all you're operating in is a sympathy. But see, Jesus says compassion Jesus wants us to look at our neighbors and our loved ones. He wants us to see their suffering in their situation and at least step out and do something about it. And I'm not saying you've got to go pay their bills. I'm not saying that you've got to go and do this, that, or the other. All I'm saying is you just need to go and reach out to them and love them. That's it. So when's the last time you've done that? Friends, we are truly better together. And if we want to see God move in our life, if we want to be used by God, we've got to be willing to step out and be who he's called us to be. 
that is the witnesses to the world of what he's done in our life. Well, Zach, I, I, don't, I don't know scripture. I mean, the only one I've got memorized is John three sixteen, bro. What if they ask me a question? But all that's fear. You just need to go tell them what God's done in your life. What is your story? Don't worry about mine. Don't worry about reciting the Torah and the Old Testament. You just need to go and tell them your story. What has Jesus done in your life? Just like Miss Don did just a moment ago. Because listen to me, friends, they can argue scripture with you all day long, but they can't argue what God has done in your life. It's time for us to go and be the church. Let's invite people to our group. Or hey, maybe you're like, you know, it's like, I don't have time to go group. Maybe it's time for you to just step out and start a group. With that, that group of people you already have in your life, start a group with them. Start encouraging them, praying for them. I'll equip you and give you everything you need to have a group. I promise you that. You just need to step out in faith and take a step towards Jesus. Let's be the church that God's called us to be. Amen? Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, I thank you for every single person in this room this morning, God. And I, I pray, God, I pray that whatever you've revealed to us as individuals this morning, that you would give us the strength and power to walk in those things. And God, I pray right now, God, that we would begin to go to our jobs and go to our schools and go throughout this community with the lens of compassion that you've given us. God, that we wouldn't get so caught up in our own issues and our own problems and our own responsibilities, God, that we forget to stop and love people. So God, I pray that you would start something in us today. That today, God, that for for many of us in this room, we would begin to see you move in our life as we heard in Miss Dawn's story, as we see in the early church. God, that as we build relationships with people, as we move forward in unity, God, that you would begin to move and we would see our neighbors saved. We would see our loved ones restored. We would see our prodigal children come back to church. God, I pray that we would begin to see those things as we trust in you and follow after you. God, give us strength. And God, more than anything this morning, I pray you would give us courage and boldness to step out even when it's not easy. Help us love people. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, before we finish up, I want to finish with this. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you've been hurt by church. Maybe there's a reason in your past. Maybe people have hurt you to the degree that You know what? You've tried religion, but you've never tried a relationship. There's never been a moment where you just surrendered your entire life to Jesus. Well, here's the good news this morning, friend. This can be that moment. Because all this matters only because of what Jesus has done for us. Because look, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can go and lead a group. You can be a part of a group. But all of it's for nothing if you don't have the foundation of a relationship with Jesus. Friends, Jesus came and died on the cross, not just died, but suffered on that cross to set us free. And he didn't just do that for Paul. He didn't just do that for Peter. He did it for you. So maybe you're here this morning and say, you know what, Zach, I I need that relationship. I need that life-changing relationship with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you want to surrender your life to him, I want to give you that opportunity right here, right now where you're seated. So if that's you, friend, just pray after me quietly to yourself. Look, there's not a formula to this. This isn't a magical prayer. It's just you in this moment trusting Jesus with your life. And you can use your own words if you'd like. But let's invite him into our life right here, right now. So if that's you, friend, pray with me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And God, I know I've messed up. And God, I wanna ask you to forgive me of my sin. And God, I want to turn from my doing life my way. And I want to start doing life your way. And Jesus, I want to make you the Lord and Savior of my life. And thank you for just now saving me. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, there's some of you here this morning that you just prayed that. And I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you or anything like that. I just want to be excited. I want to pray for you. 
If you just prayed that prayer with me, would you just lift your hand real quick? Just those that prayed that prayer. Awesome, bro. Got you over here. I don't see it. Just keep it up. Anyone else that just prayed that prayer? Got you, buddy. Just lift your hand up. Keep it up for just a moment. Just those. No one else is looking around. Awesome. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, just those of you that prayed, man, I'm so excited about your decision this morning. But this is just the beginning of that relationship. And this is a life-changing relationship. But it's a journey nonetheless. And we want to help you move forward in this relationship you're beginning this morning. So here's what's going to happen in just a moment. I'm going to have everyone stand. We're going to be dismissed. But if you prayed that prayer with me, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. It should be green. If you'll just take that card and fill it out and drop it in that wooden box in the back as you leave, we would love to help you move forward in your relationship with Jesus. And also, I think we have one Bible left. It's in the back, or it was earlier. If you go back there, you can take that Bible. It's a gift from us to you to help you move forward in your relationship with Jesus. Come on, church. We have one person pray to receive Christ this morning. Can we just give it up? Show them some love. Awesome. By the way, as of now, in the past six weeks, we've had 20 people in this service pray to receive Christ. Come on, somebody. Man, listen, I want to encourage you with this. You know, whatever people say about us, you know, all you have to do is is respond with this. I mean, God's saving people. Look, maybe Pastor Zach doesn't have it figured out. Maybe High Ridge didn't do it the way everyone else would do. But you know what? At the end of the day, God's saving people, and that's what it's about. Amen. Come on, give it up for Jesus one more time and stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I got a couple of things for you before we're dismissed. All right, if you're in here today and you haven't tried a group yet, you haven't um, been a part of a group, we have all the signups in the back, all right? Now, there are no names on there right now, but there are lots of people in those groups, okay? So if you can go back there, if you just want to look at them, all right? That's not a marriage license, okay? If you go to a group and you don't like it, try another one. That's okay, all right? But on each group back there, it has the time and the location and even the group leader's names, all right, to get you signed up for those so we can connect you to them, okay? And if you have any issues with that, just come and see me. And then the second thing I have for you guys, next Thursday, everybody say next Thursday, or this Thursday, however you look at it, whatever. This Thursday and Friday, we're gonna have a work day here at the church. Um, And so if you'd like to come and help us, we're gonna paint our kids' wing. Remember, I told you before Easter, we want to establish that kids' wing and create an awesome area for our kids uh, to get to know God and just really grow in relationship with Him. Um, But we're gonna paint. And so um, if you hate painting or you like painting, please come and show up. We'd love to, we'd love to have your help. Um, And if you're interested in that, again, it's Thursday, Friday from nine to five. Okay, and I know that's during the work week, but it's the only time I have. Um, just show up. If you, if you can do one day, that's great. If you can do one hour, that's great. If you can do none, that's awesome. Just pray about it, all right? Uh, but if you're interested in that, on each table, there's one sign-up sheet, okay? And it's at the back. It'll just say sign-ups for paint day. Um, please make sure to put your information on there so we can just reach out to you. In case we have 50 people signed up for Thursday, we'll need to divide that up for Friday, okay? But nonetheless, I just want to invite you. Invite you. No pressure, all right? If you don't come, it's totally fine. I understand you got jobs. Uh, but if you'd like to help, man, we'd love to have you, okay? All right, well, we love you guys, man. And I hope you have a blessed week. Stay warm and stay healthy. Amen? I love you guys. Have a blessed week.